Hello everyone, welcome back to the final day of Guff Insider's Festival of Innovation. We hope you've enjoyed yourself thus far. I'm Shirley, Guff Insider's Senior Reporter, and thank you for joining today's fireside chat on the future of preserving our past. Today we'll discuss how using technology can help us preserve arts and culture, and how we can tell the stories of significant moments in our lives, like the pandemic. I'm joined by the fantastic Dr. Yen Yun Chen, She's an artist and lecturer of arts and humanities in the Division of Humanities at the Yale and US College of Singapore. We also have the incredible Honor Hajar, Executive Director of the Art Science Museum at Marina Bay Sands, Singapore. Welcome Yen Yun and Honor, how are you guys today? Very good, thank you very much for the invitation to be here, Shirley. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we're doing well. No problem, it's our pleasure. And I just wanted to start off today's session with a quick get to know um, both of you. Um, why don't you start us off by sharing a bit about your work and what you do? Um, Honor, would you like to go first? Certainly. Um, well, it's it's a great pleasure to be part of the Festival of Innovation. We know that Gov Insider have got a, a really strong track record of, of fostering creative, critical and timely discussions uh, within the government sector. So um, I'm, I'm very flattered to, to be part of this year's festival. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Art Science Museum at Marina Bay Sands here in Singapore. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of leading that organization for seven years now. Um, and what we do is explore the intersection between art, science, culture, and technology. Um, we're really interested in those areas where the disciplines meet because we think that's the space where innovation occurs, where new ideas uh, kind of come to the surface and where the future is made. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very much our kind of DNA. Um, and we're, we're deeply engaged, I think, in the topics that this year's festival has, has looked into from innovation in the space of uh, kind of technology and science um, to sustainability, uh, both in terms of organisational sustainability, but environmental uh, and biodiversity sustainability as well. And we've engaged in um, some large scale exhibitions and programmes over the years that really drill into these topics in quite some detail. And I guess it's nice maybe to just mention one because it's what connects uh, kind of um, uh, the two panellists today. Mm -hmm. um, the last big exhibition that we presented in the museum before the pandemic started was called 2219 Futures Imagined. And mm -hmm. it was a show that we brought into the museum to commemorate the Singapore Bicentennial in 2019, which looked 200 years in the past. But we took that 200 year time scale and projected it 200 years in the future mm -hmm. and looked at how Singapore uh, and its place in the world uh, kind of might evolve uh, kind of over the next 200 years. And the final artist in that exhibition was Yan Yan Chen. So I thought <laughs> I would just mention that as a way of bridging the two of us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Yan Yun, would you like to go next? Um, give us a brief introduction of yourself and what you do. Sure. Um, it's an honour to be here and I'm very grateful to the Festival of Innovation and Gulf Insider for having me and also to share the space with honour. It's such a it's such a privilege. Um, and yes, I was part of the um, exhibition for Art Science um, in 2019. Um, so just a little short introduction. My, my name is Yen Yun. I am a visual artist. Um, my background training includes animation, um, storytelling, as well as classical fine art. And I work a lot uh, in the contemporary art space. So I sort of straddle quite a few time zones in terms of uh, art, artworks and art history. Um, also, kind of my research is involved with the idea of cultural wounds, things mm -hmm. that we carry along the way, whether it be it like scars or narratives or perceptions of womanhood um, in the embodied in dowry tradition mm -hmm. shown in Art Science Museum. Um, and I'm very concerned and interested in this narratives that we carry with ourselves and, mm -hmm. and carry along across generations and into the future. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of my personal practice and research. Um, my day job, I am a lecturer at Yale and US College. I'm also the art practice coordinator. And one of the things that I do a lot with the student is to try to visualize and explore the possibilities of having 
arts and practicing mm-hmm. art, contemporary art, art history within a liberal arts context. And in the past mm-hmm. uh, years, past six years I've been there, it's been a constant evolution of figuring out what makes sense um, mm-hmm. in our space and, and how do we collaborate across different disciplines and um, across different majors. And to try to integrate spaces like urban studies with art environmental sciences with art and find and explore different avenues that art practice can contribute into larger discourses about you know humanity about sustainability and, and environment so that's what i do mm-hmm. perfect thanks so much yen yun and you mentioned something around um, narratives which is something that i really want to touch on as well and one, one of the um starting questions that i have for both um yourself, yen yun and honor um, what are some ways the pandemic has actually affected art and culture and perhaps Yen Yun, um, you can go first in, in sharing about the ways that it has affected your work as an artist and a lecturer. So, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, first I have to say that the, you know, I think it's already all over the news and everybody has heard about it, or the closure of spaces um, that has happened over the past two years. So places such as um, the substation, CCAs, uh, public exhibition space, ITI, Necessary Stage, Centre 42, all these spaces, independent art spaces in particular, Mm -hmm. were affected. Um, I won't say purely by the pandemic, but it definitely exacerbated its closure. And I think Yale and US is also part of, you know, one of the institutions that are being closed right now um, because because of the pandemic, things are changing directions. And so it has chaos. I mean, the pandemic has introduced a lot of chaos into the art scene in Singapore. Personally, um, a lot of exhibitions were either cancelled or postponed. Um, the inability to travel means that I have fewer uh, opportunities to have exchanges with residencies mm. and institutions or even accessing um, archives that are not housed in Singapore. So mm. um, there are a lot of disruptions, um, but we are holding on and holding strong and adapting to ha- uh, ways around the art spaces, how you know, a lot of the exhibitions are going online. Mm-hmm. Um, art fairs as well. They are trying to use things like virtual reality or three D modeling to, you know, still engage with its collectors and audiences. Um, we we're doing a lot more things on uh, media and video work because it travels easier and we mm-hmm. have less interruptions in terms of transporting work overseas. Um, and in college, you know, it's with all the social distancing requirements, um, the lack of space. The you know, we have to re- we really have to adapt um, in terms of classes and move some of them online or rewrite curriculum. So there's been a lot of dynamic changes um, in mm. sort of a response to the pandemic. So that's mm. kind of how what we're dealing with right now. Mm-hmm, definitely, Anna, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Yes, I th- I I think it's it's valuable to perhaps acknowledge the. Um, the space of anxiety and pain of the pandemic before we kind of move on to looking at where the, you know, kind of the pivots and the points of resilience mm-hmm. are. I think it's really important we use these platforms to kind of hold a, a, a little bit of space to talk about how how uh, traumatic the pandemic's been on a personal level for all of the team members that we work with in the museum sector and the gallery sector and the education sector, all our government colleagues who are who are listening now we know that this has been a really really difficult year difficult beyond what we are able to put into words right now um for the museum sector internationally it's been um catastrophic if we can be really frank Mm -hmm. um the museum sector is very uh internationally kind of integrated and big museums uh, tend to work with one another extensively on the production and touring of large exhibitions because big scale exhibitions like those that we see in Art Science Museum or National Gallery of Singapore or ACM um, tend to you know kind of need multiple institutions to be able to put them together. And with the pandemic hitting different parts of the world um, with, with different levels of severity at different times, um, this has created a, a, a massive avalanche of disruption through the museum sector and, of course, the performing arts sector as well and, and mm-hmm. internationally. Uh, you, you know, European museums were closed for months and months. Um, yeah. American museums were closed for, for some of them even longer. And a lot of institutions never reopened. They never came back. Um, so 
that dealing with you know kind of that as a sector has been uh, kind of very very challenging and we are deeply fortunate actually in Singapore that um, the museum sector was able to uh, you know kind of close for only those six weeks of the circuit mm -hmm. breaker and since that point we've been able to be open and, and address audiences and internationally that's a highly privileged position to be in and so I think all of us and certainly I can speak for Art Science Museum here we've tried to um, uh, take that privilege and do something important with it because having the um, having the you know kind of the opportunity to talk to audiences at a time where we know that people are going through a very difficult time is is it's super important and we've got to think very carefully about what we say and how mm. we meet our audiences emotionally so mm. so yeah I, we, we all know about the impacts that the pandemic has had on making people go digital and blah 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 we've talked about that for you know 18 months already but I think I think it's it's important to make make space to be able to acknowledge that kind of more emotional and mental health impact as well mm. uh, because I, my sense is that we're really starting to see the impact of that in Singapore now. Yeah. In all sorts of ways, society lead that weren't entirely expected. Um, and so as cultural institutions, we've got to be, we've really got to lean into trying to understand that. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I guess as a follow-up question um, to what both um, yourself and Yan Yun you've mentioned, um, you know, when we think about the pandemic and what it, what it's um where it's taken us, you know, it's so fluid. Things are changing um, every day. And you know, I've seen places like the Museum of American History launch appeals for pandemic artifacts like masks and PPE and the like. And you know, how how do you think we can best preserve this pandemic story for future generations? And you know, tell this to them in a way that you know is accurate and really um encapsulates what we are going through today. Um, Yanin, would you like to go first? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to remembering stories and especially like uh, reclaiming and preserving stories for a future audience, I think there are two points that I constantly go back to um, as uh, starting points for thought. One is the acknowledgement and understanding of the texture of loss, which Honor has kindly you know, reminded us that you know, it's important to open space for the feelings um, of the people and the communities that were affected during the time. And the second is to really consider what it means to open a space of care. So knowing what has been lost, knowing what has changed and recognizing the feelings that come with those changes and chaos, and then learning what it means to take care of other people. I think, you know, regardless of how we approach um, the idea of preservation and the tools that we will need in order to preserve stories, I think it's important that these two things are first looked at. And so, um, you know, and the National Gallery, that's the um, picturing the pandemic, not National Gallery, so the National Museum, that's the picturing mm -hmm. the pandemic exhibition, where there have been artists collecting stories of the communities and how they have navigated the pandemic last year. Um, there were really powerful documentary works that I saw um, that were featured like by artists like Edda Ng and Dave Lin, where they went around photographing the spaces and how mm. interaction has changed, how behaviors, human behaviors have changed because, you know, with social distancing, with the mask, with our inability to identify each other, even though we might know each other for a long time because you can't see like half the face. I think yeah. these little things um, that change the way we approach people and you know have social kind of time and spaces. I think these are very interesting moments to collect because I think it affects everybody. So it's, it's more intimate, I think, in terms of story. It's very personal, um, but it's something that echoes across communities. So it doesn't matter which background or where you come from. Um, these are stories that everyone share. So there is that that I think is extremely valuable. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I think about when we talk about reclaiming stories is also what, how do we want to tell this story to someone <sighs> else who never goes through this um, yeah. situation? And how would we like them to remember um, us and the communities and institutions that have put in so much work in order to help everybody out during this time? I think that's another thing. And also recognizing the mistakes and the flaws 
that have come with some of the policies and protocols that have happened during the time because everybody makes mistakes. It's just how do we then navigate around it, but accept yeah. that those things did happen too. So I think being honest is also very crucial. Yeah. Um, mm. Mm. Okay, got it. Um, Anna, would you have anything to add? I, I do want to acknowledge the fantastic work that the uh, the National Heritage board museums are doing and, and really trying to capture the texture of the lived experience of, of the pandemic in Singapore. Um, I'm, I'm part of the Museum Roundtable, uh, kind of, uh, which is the collective of uh, kind of both public and private museums in Singapore. And um, it's been obviously every time we meet now where we're speaking about the impact of, of, of the pandemic and how hard it is to be able to storytell a crisis when you're in the crisis mm, you know yeah. that's extremely hard but at the same time for collecting institutions such as uh, the National Museum they have to try because uh, you know kind of everything from you know as you mentioned collecting kind of examples of PPE but also documenting the very particular uh, kind of texture of the pandemic in Singapore mm -hmm. the red t-shirts of the safe distancing ambassadors their stories because they all came from somewhere else. You know, they, they've, they're, they're all from other industries which are heavily hit. Um, the, you know, kind of the safe distancing kind of red and white tape. You know, kind of these are things that, uh, you know, kind of are the visual texture mm -hmm. of the pandemic, which won't make any sense at all, you know, kind of to future generations unless we can yeah. somehow set them in context. And I'm, I'm actually very heartened that uh, kind of, our national institutions are, are, are taking the trouble to try and mm -hmm. make sense of that. Uh, it's going to be extremely valuable uh, kind of for future generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to also um, bring our conversation to, um, you know, the different mediums that at which um, art, culture and heritage can be um, brought across and shared with communities. And I think an, something that comes to mind is, um, you know, in telling what, how people felt during the pandemic and what they went through. A lot of it is has been expressed on social media. And, you know, I've seen um, also museums sort of try to document videos and um, even Instagram stories of people who have gone through lockdowns. Um, so Honor and Yenrin, how, how do you think um, technology and platforms like social media can actually change the way um, or even shape the way that stories are being told? Um, well, I guess you know the, there's there's the the po the positive sides of social media, but then there's the 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 dark side as well. What there's what, what's been unquestionably useful, I think, is um, uh, how technologies like this, you know, kind of mm -hmm. platforms like this, we're on Zoom and our audience are watching this, uh, you know, kind of on the web, um, have enabled uh, kind of communities to stay together at times where safe distancing and safe management has kept us apart and that's been a lifeline frankly you know kind of for for, for, for many people and families and and communities um, and having a, a platform to be able to tell stories keep in touch mm. show empathy create spaces of care as Daniel beautifully spoke about earlier has been utterly critical but the downside of that is that you know kind of social media has also been a space for the propagation of some um, you know, the other pandemic, the pandemic of misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. And that's been very alarming to see. I don't think it's been particularly surprising because it was very much underway pre-pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. but it's been deeply uh, distressing, I think, for, for communities, particularly in other places, I think, uh, in other countries to see, uh, you know, kind of communities torn apart um, and battle lines being drawn uh, kind of through social media. It's amplified the tribism, which I guess has always been present in society. Uh, and social media is, has, has kind of really, you know, kind of um, uh, sort of, yeah, amplified and, and enlarged that. So, you know, as with everything, technology has uh, kind of both positive and negative um, effects. And yeah. we've certainly seen both in these contexts. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yenrin, would you like to um, add anything? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Honest, um, you know, yeah, explanation of like how social media has affected our lives, both in positive and negative ways. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge another factor that's often dismissed because it's some in Singapore, at the very least, it's sort of separate or like discussed as different from arts, which is entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of us survive, at least from, speaking for myself, I survived the pandemic by spending way too much time on like Netflix or Disney Plus <laughs> or anything just to keep my sanity. Um, but I also want to acknowledge video games. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not the biggest gamer in the world, but I do real, I do, I found myself diving into massive world games last year during the pandemic just because I haven't seen people for a while. Mm-hmm. And I really miss just like sitting in a cafe and just watching people go by on their day-to-day to to the point that I ended up spending hundreds of hours in an MMORPG game just to watch other gamers walk around in a virtual (laughs) space just to feel less lonely. Mm. And so I think that there's there's a lot to be said about how the arts in the terms of the entertainment and commercial sector and how much they have actually done for us during this time. And to also recognize that this is art. It's not a separate space. It's part and parcel of the creative industry trying their very best to give people different options. So be it walking into a museum, be it you know going for galleries and speaking to artists, but also just sitting at home and enjoying content that's presented on your screen like so quickly and so easily and the stories mm-hmm. that are being told. I think that there's something there that it, it, you know, I'm, I'm seeing more and more that it's important to recognize that these are forms of art. You know, just as much as that painting hanging on the wall, which I do, I think all of that needs to be considered together and to sort of embrace it as a whole industry that's not you know, sectionalized or segmented and mm-hmm. talked about separately as if they are totally different spaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Yenru and I, I relate with you. I spent a lot of time on Animal Crossing. I'm not sure if you guys know about that name, that game, but yeah, it it gave a, like a sort of an escape from the pandemic, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> And I guess something else that I also wanted to discuss outside of the pandemic is, um, you know, issues like climate change and even um, social issues like social equality, race. Um, art, art has been a powerful mover of conversations around um, these sort of issues. And how, how perhaps in, for Yen Yun and Honor in your work, um, how do you um, use um, your, your work to sort of shape these conversations? And has technology helped to tell the story better? So maybe I could take the this one first specifically around the, the topic of climate change and environmental mm. topics because that's something that we've we've done a lot of work on at Art Science Museum and it's something I'm really passionate about yeah. because we all know, I think intellectually, and I would certainly hope that our colleagues who are who are listening uh, kind of on the fireside chat today know this uh, kind of from a government policy perspective that climate change is going to create transformational effects for our generation but particularly the the generation following us we know that intellectually you know kind of like there's no um, I think dispute of that uh, kind of within our society mm-hmm. in Singapore and yet there is undeniably an emotional disconnect between that that uh, kind of intellectual, you know, sort of yeah. understanding of the fact and uh, the kind of uh, emotional onboarding of what that means for us and what we're prepared to do in terms of mm-hmm. behaviour change yeah. uh, in the short term to change, you know, kind of this outcome. This is a very um, uh, big problem. And one of the things that we've we've thought a lot about at Art Science Museum and, and backed it up with, with some practical work is how we can, uh, you know, kind of harness the uh, one of the greatest qualities of working with artists, whether they're filmmakers, writers, visual artists, or musicians, which is to speak to uh, kind of the emotions of uh, kind of audiences. Um, artists are better at that than anyone. Um, mm-hmm. And how, you know, kind of we can maybe cut through that sort of intellectual fatigue, uh, kind of which yeah. is started to coalesce around issues such as climate change, sea level mm-hmm. rise, food, food scarcity, all those get soil degradation, all those really scary topics, yeah. um, and, and, and speak to the hearts of, mm-hmm. um, of, of people. And, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why we've done projects in the museum like Into the Wild, which used augmented reality technology to try and tell the story of deforestation mm-hmm. in Southeast Asia but in a way that created empathy 
and uh, kind of encouraged our visitors to actually do something really concrete about, you know, kind of deforestation, which, as we know, leads to the haze yeah. by planting trees in Indonesia. And through that project, we planted 10,000 new trees in wow. one of the areas in Sumatra, which literally, you know, kind of dr drives the haze into Singapore. Um, and, that, that, you know, kind of giving people the opportunity to do something that practical can create mm. a, a lifelong change, mm. you know, kind of like now they're, now they're part of a solution as opposed to contributing to the, to the problem. Um, and this was absolutely the motivation behind our 2219 exhibition to, to try and take people on an emotional journey into the future and to kind of show them what uh, kind of climate change and the issues associated with climate change will do um, to Singapore and the world. And not, mm. and, and not in a way of shocking people, actually, in a way of kind of almost tending to the emotion which is going to be most needed uh, kind yeah. of to tackle these issues which is courage mm. you know to try and build that sense of you know almost sort of prehearsal about what we're going to go through so that we can find those moments of levity and resilience and coping along the journey because yeah, we, we feel that as institutions who work with artists and scientists we have a really big responsibility to do the work Mm -hmm. you know kind of here we can't abandon it it's yeah. it's not morally right we have to keep focused on the task of you know kind of bringing our audiences you know kind of into the emotional space of being able to deal with this stuff mm -hmm. um no matter how hard it is so I guess that's my take on this um but Yan Yan's been also dealing with this too so interested in her take yeah she's got yeah. here I, I'm, I'm just soaking in what Honor just talked about, like, you know, giving space for emotions. And I'm, I'm just really grateful um, that this is acknowledged because I think, okay, so I guess I'll speak from an artist's point of view and it's very personal, so I won't be speaking for other artists. But personally for me, when I, when I do a work or when I start telling a story, I always find it a bit contrived to be speaking for someone else. So a lot of my stories start from myself and I sort of dig deep into what were the feelings involved um, when a certain topic or theme is, is of choice. So, you know, there's a story about dowry objects and dowry traditions mm -hmm. and Chinese weddings. A lot of what I excavate is actually my family history and my own relationship with it. And I think that's where I speak from through the works because I feel like, you know, it can start to sound very pedantic if I'm explaining how things work but it feels more honest if I just say what I'm feeling mm. and if someone sort of connects with it it becomes it's a story that extends and and um, speaks to someone else or touches someone else in a different sort of way and so I think one of the, the how technology sort of fits in is technology to me is a tool it's just a tool it's one yeah. more way of telling another story and the, not every story needs um, high, tech, not high tech kind of equipment to do um, and it really depends on the kind of universe I'm trying to create mm -hmm. um, I think technology um, that when I when I make works um, using like VR or AR I always come to the point where I realize that distribution is going to, to be an issue not everyone has a headset mm -hmm. how do we then navigate the headset um, you know who can use it and during a pandemic how do we share equipment? It's such a huge question. Um, There's a lot of things to think about in terms of exhibitions as well. Like what do we do now since people can't touch um, yeah. objects in space? And, and I, I, I wanted to like uh, talk a little bit about virtual realms at Art Science Museum, which I had a whole lot of fun as a gamer, um, uh, which is just how do you navigate or interact with a space without having to touch it? I think mm -hmm. that's, a, that's one of the things that um, it's, it's underlying in that exhibition. It's like, okay, if you want to do an interactive storytelling sort of uh, environment, how do we do it without having to go, you know, bypass all the pandemic restrictions and how do we go about it? So the challenges, um, te technology help us with these challenges, like, you know, especially dealing with, you know, very practical things like not sharing equipment, not touching yeah. objects. Um, but in terms of narrative wise, I think technology, um, it's, it's just how you use it. It's just another tool. 
Um, but it cannot become the main point of the story, mm. I find. Uh, at least this is my point of view. Mm-hmm. It cannot, o- it just can't take over the entire space of the story. And yeah, it definitely. cannot come to the point where the technology is more important than the content it's trying to deliver. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so, so, I mean, this is definitely just me, my, from my angle, um, when it comes to using tech uh, and different kinds of equipment and different installation of spaces. Um, and the kinds of interactivity that we can develop u- using the different technologies. Um, because mm-hmm. my background is in animation and then fine art, I've always tried to sort of bring the two together. Yeah. You know, how do you tell a classical story or a very visual story using digital medium, but not to the extent that it becomes alienating for someone? So mm-hmm. these are just stuff to think about, at least on my own as an artist. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for sharing that, Yan Yun. And I wish we could... Um, continue on our conversation but we are just reaching the um, final minutes of the session um if i could do like a quick fire round um who who or what inspires you in your work um yen yun and honor um just a quick one (laughs) honor would you like to go first right now the the uh kind of the artist who's inspiring me more than uh kind of any other is uh janet cardiff the uh canadian uh, kind of sound artist whose masterpiece Forty Part Motet is um, is in Singapore right now uh, at the Art Science Museum. But to me, the greatest work of contemporary art made anywhere in the world in in the last twenty years. And having this in Singapore, um, uh, kind of it's a choral celebration of of life, um, kind of through the voices of forty singers, um, has been incredibly cathartic, actually. Uh, and one of my favourite things to do right now is to just go into the galleries and sit with that work and hear the singers sing um, mm-hmm. kind of as often as I can. And it just creates this amazing space of kind of peace and, um, and, and harmony. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's what inspires me right now. <laughs> Fantastic. How about you, Yen Yun? Um, I have to say it's my students at Yale and US, both the alumni as well as the current students. You know, given the the closure of Yale and US College and the chaos that has ensued since and all the media and all the, the, the you know, all the challenges that the students have to face, they've rallied together mm-hmm. and started to realize what how, how they want to be remembered is crucial in the narrative of this college. And so just watching them come together as a community, you know, strategizing ways of, you know, approaching the, the general public and explaining what this place means to them you know, tapping into their feelings, making works, you know, even navigating like PR and comm strategies and, you know, working with student, current students' parents and current students who are currently trying to figure out what to do with their lives. I think that is super inspiring. And, um, you know, speaking of the previous question that you brought up about, you know, advocacy, um, about climate, social activism and things, I feel like this new generation is going to bring so much energy you know, in spite of all, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of the closure, in spite of all the challenges that has been thrown at them. So Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about this new group of uh, students that are coming up. Yeah. (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that, Yan Yun. And thank you so much to the both of you for joining us today. I really wish we had more time, but unfortunately, we've come to the end of our session and wanted to thank our audience members as well for tuning in. So, um, to that, um, we've come to the end of our session. So do come back later at 3 p.m. to join our fireside chat on Rebuilding for Good. So you'll hear from Dr. Pire Toniris from the OECD, Jonathan Wong from UNSCAP, and Spencer Mali from AWS. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much, ladies, and goodbye. <laughs>